consumption of natural resources work at the general European level and then focus a bit in on waste uh, at the UK, and particularly England level. I'm going to do the share a favour though and, and cut that little bit at the end short. If any of you share my enthusiasm for rubbish south of the border, do uh, grab me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, our work on Europe and the consumption of natural resources focuses mainly on our concern that Europe doesn't measure uh, its, its consumption of natural resources. There's an adage that if you don't measure, or you can't manage what you don't measure. And so what we've been pushing for is for Europe to adopt uh, uh, holistic, uh, overarching measures that, that cross uh, the consumption of natural resources. We work with CERI, the Sustainable Europe Research Institute in Austria, to develop those indices. Um, many of you probably heard of the concept of, uh, well, of the example of the ecological footprint, uh, which, which basically condenses, aggregates uh, consumption of all resources into one unit, which is the uh, global hectares. What, what we propose um, is slightly different to that in that with, with CIRU, uh, we concluded that you can only aggregate so far before you lose the definition required for good policy making. Um, so our four indices include materials, which you can break into biotic and abiotic uh, materials, water, land area, and greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that is the consumption, so not just what's, what's being territorially consumed, but it's the embedded, the footprint total, if you see what I mean. If you take materials as an example, and um, we saw a useful graph just then from uh, Pedro, which showed how uh, different countries have been progressing at different rates in terms of decoupling the consumption of materials from uh, GDP. We have made great strides uh, in increasing resource efficiency, so we now use less and we spend less to make the same thing. But nonetheless, we are consuming more, and we look set to continue to consume more. Mobile phones are a great example of that. They used to be that big, not quite, but getting on for it, and cost a fair amount more than they do now. Nowadays, lots of people have more than two, several mobile phones. Uh, similar issue with land. Uh, land is the ultimate in finite resources until we start uh, invading Mars. Um, and we use, we use a lot of it already, but we're set to use much more as we move away from a fossil-based economy increasingly towards one where we replace materials like plastics uh, that are derived from oil with, with those that we've got from plant-based crops. Uh, ditto energy, replacing coal power stations with biomass, timber. Uh, a huge power station in this country called Drax, which is looking at, at doing just that. And of course, more people all around the world moving to more meat-based diets uh, and consuming more stuff. We're losing land, though, at the same rate. We're losing it to climate change, to uh, growth in population as we build on more land, and of course, water scarcity as well. Uh, and on top of that, we need to consider the rights and the well-being of the people who live on that, as well as, of course, the creatures that we share the planet with and that are essential to our survival. Moving on to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and this graph, I think, really uh, gives the lie, particularly to the UK claims to be doing so well under uh, emissions reductions. Um, we do all right under the Kyoto uh, um, Protocol, where it's all counted on a territorial basis, but once you factor in, of course, how much is in, imported along with the goods that you're buying, and if you've exported a lot of your manufacturing industry, uh, then, then of course you might look as if you've made cuts at home, but in fact overall your emissions may have gone up. And I think the UK results, uh, emissions have actually gone up by about 16% uh, since uh, the Kyoto benchmark. So we need to factor in our footprints for land, for water, for materials. Uh, water here, a classic example, a cup of coffee takes 140 litres of water to make it. And if you look at the macro version of that, again, you can see that, that Europe is, is the pinkest area, uh, really, as, as far as continents go, uh, with certain countries in that, again, Britain, Germany, and Italy being very heavily dependent on imports of water. Now, those of you who are here from the States um, may look at the southern portion of that and say, why isn't that bright red? Uh, of course, with the severe droughts going on there. But the, the point of this graph, of course, is export versus import. Again, we heard a bit about that earlier on. Um, so, so the southern US is, of course, very water-stressed at the moment, but on balance, the country is exporting more water than it's importing. 
And I think this also shows why this is very much more than just an environmental issue. It is absolutely about economic well-being and security. And this is why Europe does need to be measuring on the step towards then managing and reducing its resource use, because increasingly this is going to be an issue of economic and, and general security. An example of, of that kind of thinking and how to apply uh, what we're proposing here is, is with biofuels. Now, a few years ago, Europe decided that it was going to adopt uh, a target for 5% and then 10% of transport fuels to come from biofuels. Now, had our four indicators been in the room and the part of policy making at the time, which is what we're proposing, then we wonder whether or not we wouldn't have gone down that route of setting that target. If you look at biofuels just in terms of reducing the abiotic resource, the oil, and supposedly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, although there are, there's a lot of controversy over whether biofuels help us do that, then, then you'd see that you would have made excluded some of the others, and we think that was excluded in the process, notably, of course, land and the fact that Europe looks set increasingly to be relying on large portions of Malaysia and Indonesia to effectively be annexed towards our biofuels targets. Similarly with moving to more renewable energy, uh, how much land will be required uh, if we were going to get all of our energy from wind as opposed to, say, coal. Now, again, this isn't to say that, that renewables are bad and wind is bad, but we need to be thinking across the whole suite and the whole board. And I think that what this really says is that we need to be looking at reducing our consumption, because ultimately we're going to run out of space, we're going to run out of land, materials and water and so on if we don't look to do that. Uh, this is a quote from a report on water that was published in, it was across the media yesterday, uh, some of you may have seen it, uh, Michelle uh, Wooker, or Wooker, I'm not sure the pronunciation, from the North America Foundation uh, think tank which did this report. We're introducing all kinds of technology to reduce the carbon impact of energy without anything to reduce its impact on water. And the, what the report's point was there was that uh, there was a lot of water involved in generating even renewable energy, let alone all of the fossil fuels. And, and that, that thinking, that cross board, cross the suite of, of impacts thinking, hasn't been happening. And this is what we need to be joining up, look at a macro data level. So what we want from the EU then is, is the adoption of those indicators. They're very top line. They are, uh, they are based on, on a largely developed, and I say largely because the exception is probably land, we need to do a bit more work on it. But again, as we saw earlier on, there, there is an extensive data set already for greenhouse gas emissions, for the materials that we import and export, uh, and even the water footprint is very well developed these days. Um, so they need to be adopted, they need to be brought into the policy making process, and we would like to see that, that the EU and national member states are, are using those to measure the amount they're consuming and to be setting themselves on the path to be reducing that. If those are incorporated into policy making across the board, then we think that Europe will be able to set itself on a course for a much more resource efficient and therefore a safer, not just in terms of environment, but also economically, security and so on, economy. So I'm going to wrap up there. As I said, if anybody wants to talk waste with me, I've got more slides. Um, and I don't know whether or not we will be sharing these slides. Uh, if so, then uh, obviously you can get hold of them and their missing portion. Um, or email me at julian.kirby at foe.co.uk. Thank you very much. <laughs>